you're listening to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Anthony Kreiss, Visiting Assistant Professor of Law at the Chicago Kent College of Law. We will discuss his new article, Anxious Masculinity, American Homophobia and the Third Sex. So welcome to the podcast, Anthony. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I really enjoyed reading your paper, which tells this fascinating really detailed and lovely historical story, um, which I totally want to get into. But I was wondering if you could kind of frame it with the premise of the article, which sort of puts it more in the legal scholarship camp rather than just the history camp. Um, so so you, you begin the paper by talking about Essentially, as I read it, a, a kind of confusion in the law of sexuality, mm -hmm. which you see as rooted in the history or kind of historical development of the concept of gender. And I was wondering if you could kind of just talk a little bit about that confusion for people who may not be as familiar with the law of sexuality um, as a way of kind of framing some of the historical discussion for listeners. Yeah. So I I, I think one of the things that's always confused me, bothered me, uh, made me more curious about, about the law of sexuality is how courts just seem incapable of understanding it in any comprehensive way. Um, and, and so when, when the courts talk about issues of, of sexuality and gender and sex, they conflate terms that we otherwise wouldn't conflate. Um, you know, we create rules that, that just seem very uh, unique in the sex-based discrimination context. So, you know, we, for example, we're very anti-classification when it comes to race discrimination. Anything that, you know, that anything that, that classifies people on the basis of race, we're very, um, you know, we push back against in the law pretty quickly. But that's not true of, of sex and gender. And so, um, a lot of these questions have, have percolated in my mind for, for some time um, as to why that is. And that's been, you know, I, I would say triply the case now um, as we're in, in a moment in time where the, the Supreme Court is about to maybe hear uh, a series of cases about whether sex discrimination includes sexual orientation discrimination, whether it includes transgender discrimination, um, you know, and, and how that relates to sex discrimination um, in terms of sex stereotyping for, for even um, men and women removed from the LGBTQ context. So, so that's kind of where I was coming from in this piece was to, to try to understand um, in, a, in a broader sense where we got to where we are in the law today. So maybe as a way of kind of like defining terms a little bit, mm -hmm. you could briefly describe how we ought to be using the terms sex and gender in relation to how those terms actually get used in the context of the the law of sexuality. Because I think that might be helpful for people in understanding the sort of historical story you're telling. Yeah. So So I think – Generally speaking, in 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 the way I would t use the terms, um, I would talk about sex in terms of um, you know the the way we classify people at birth, right? Male, female, um, and then gender is the the kinds of roles that we assign to people based on uh, our understandings culturally of of what people should do in terms of masculinity and femininity, femininity um, and, and the kinds of uh, tasks that we, we associate with people based on, um, right. Their, their sex assigned at birth. Um, what happens typically in, in jurisprudence is we, we just conflate the term sex and gender and use them interchangeably. Um, largely because we see as a society, uh, sex and gender is being both binary and and overlapping in, in a you know in a, in a very complete way, right? So we think of of uh, you know women and femininity and and female roles as being kind of one silo, and then men masculinity and male roles being in another. Um, but of course, right, the real world doesn't work in those kinds of discrete categories, uh, you know, in, in that way. Um, and so that's kind of my approach. Um, 
or how I like to, to think about it in terms of, right, there's the kind of the reality where things are much more fluid and, and not as rigid as the courts tend to see them. Um, but, but the courts also use these terms interchangeably in a way that I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, I mean, it, it, it seemed to me as if essentially sex is sort of like a biological category and gender seems like a more social category. And that there's this weird irony in the sense that the law of sexuality uses biological terms to try to manage social relationships, which seems like a kind of confusion of categories, as it were. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that's right. Um, and you know the, the the interesting thing is um you know that that the lgbtq cases really challenge right that the way that the that courts and the law have treated sex and gender as one and the same and have confused these terms and i think that's one of the reasons why we see such pushback from sub, from some corners um, in this kind of in this litigation and in this this uh you know legal space is because um Right, these issues challenge some of those baseline preconceptions that people have. Yeah, I mean, it seems like in your paper, you describe the emergence of the modern concept of gender and the role of LGBTQ and any other kind of gender, gender based expressions, as it were. I mean, including like non LGBTQ. Uh, gender expressions as sort of part of the kind of historical challenge being posed. And I was wondering me if, if it might be not be a good time to kind of launch into some of that historical conversation. You sort of periodize American history into, into three parts and explain how gender was conceptualized in relation to society differently in those periods. Um, I was wondering, maybe, maybe you could kind of start at the beginning and, and walk, walk us through what happened as it were. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, in, in the initial era of American life, which, you know, I think is, I tend to think of as being agrarian, um, the family is the economic unit of production. And so in order to be successful and to thrive economically, you have to form a traditional family unit. Um, and so that, that means a, that means a few things. It means that one, right, um, that, that the, the concept of, um, dividing labor, um, in terms of men, women, husbands, wives, isn't quite exactly the same as we might think of it today, right? That, that, that all these different family members are different, uh, you know, they, they provide different uh, things to the, you know, the familial co- corporate whole. Um, and so that, you know, you have just this, this very patriarchal structure, nevertheless, um, where men still exercise, right, the, the, all the political and civil rights um, for for the family, um, and and is really seen as you know the, the head of the you know the legal head of the household um, you know as a matter of law. Um, now, one part or one thing that I think that I'd like that I'm going to improve in the paper, and I think is important here, um, is during this agrarian era, because men were so important in the family structure and kind of the central key figure in the family structure. Um, when men did bad things, <laughs> women didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, freedom to, uh, to push back against that. And one thing that, that I think has been not looked at quite enough has been the, you know, the early temperance movement. Um, right. So, so in this, you know, in the, in the, we'll say the 19th century, um, men are right. They're getting drunk. They're abusive. They're just, you know, they're wasting their money, um, on, on alcohol and, and really not being terribly wonderful providers, uh, for, for their families. And women push back against this in some early temperance movements. Um, and so temperance in my view, uh, is in large part a social reform effort to restore masculinity, and it's part of this progressive idea that masculinity is is you know should be equated to economic productivity and economic success and thriving uh, economic prosperity, right? All these all these things. 
And in the in the late 1800s, part of that you know that that effort to uh, reform masculinity, and which in large part you know I think took uh, form in the temperance movement, although there's there's other areas where it took place. Um, you see these these social reformers going into places which they thought were you know just in complete uh, <laughs> these dives, um, very you know the, these very body broady um, boisterous uh, places that served alcohol, and they're trying to shut these places down. And when they do that in New York and in Chicago and some of these bigger cities, they discover. Uh, that there are bars that cater towards gay men, um, and they're they're appalled by the things that they see. Now, I think the things that they're appalled by are telling, because they, that has longer term implications for the historical development of law and sexuality. Um, but it, I think we also have to understand it as growing out of this mindset that they are there as progressives to combat alcohol uh, abuse, to combat you know the ills of, of urbanization and industrialization. And, and so when they see men drinking and dancing and wearing makeup and calling each other by feminine names, um, you know, with you know, dancing like women and, and dressing kind of in a more feminine way, if not, you know, wearing women's apparel, um, you know, publicly in these, in these bars, they, they see this, they have this sense of, of uh, you know, they have to immediately get reform done, right? That they have to shut these bars down, they have to close these, these resorts for degenerates, uh, but again, it's all kind of growing out of this idea that they are there to reform the family, right? That they're there to restore masculinity and protect the home, right? It's home protection. Um, and so I think that's an important story there, right? That, that, that the first interactions some of these uh, progressive you know, social reformers had uh, in, in, in seeing this kind of emerging LGBTQ cultural identity and this community – um, was a res- was a result of them trying to reform masculinity and protect the home. Yeah, well, you know it, that that I think that that totally makes sense to me, and it really ties back to something else that I noticed reading your paper, which hadn't really occurred to me in quite this way before, which was how during the agrarian period you describe there was a kind of policing of productivity. And gender seen as being essentially synonymous to each other. And it, it, it seems as if the emergence of these kind of alternative gender expressions was deeply tied to economic liberalization yeah. in a sense and the disaggregation of kind of economic productivity and and gender expression. So like at a moment in time when it was possible to be economically productive outside the family unit is where you start to see um, a sort of a broader range of gender expression. Is, is that a fair assessment, do you think? Yeah. I, and, I, and I think there's a few things that are important to point out here, right? So the first thing is when you, when you have the ability to provide for yourself, to sell your labor for wages, um, to move to a city where you're not right under the constant surveillance of, of small, you know, a small town, um, or you know, where where you don't interact with numerous people uh, that you don't know in any given day, where you have the ability to form your own relationships, right, your own community, your own sense of identity um, that you don't have if you're back in that agrarian model, reliant upon. Uh, the family is that right that economic unit of of production, so I think that's an incredibly important uh point right that 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 permit or that gave the or created the conditions necessary in part for that kind of environment to to thrive at the same time those developments create a terrible amount of anxiety uh again about the role of men, masculinity, and the home, right? Because 
if you if if women can go out and and earn their own living and don't need uh you know a husband to be successful and um right if if people can form their own family units or not form family units as they as they want that undermines right the patriarchal norms where the man is the head of the household and so you get this kind of market labor divide where men are supposed to be the ones that go out into the workforce and earn uh, right to sell their labor for wages and earn the, the the income and be breadwinners and women are the 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 ones who are supposed to be the keepers of the home and 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 raise children and things like that um, which again all of that you know that whole kind of anxiety which fed into that need for reform um, right it's it's still fundamentally about reforming masculinity and and preserving right the home and preserving kind of that you know that kind of uh, patriarchal structure. Um, so you have a lot of really anxious um, masculinities um, going on here, right? That between the, the the effects of industrialization and urbanization, and some of these underlying longer term social movements, um, which you know come you know butt heads directly with these emerging LGBTQ cultural spaces, which are in bars, which uh, you know these folks seem see. Um, as being really detrimental to the family, to the home, and to this kind of you know Protestant American identity. Yeah, and and and, and one of the things in the paper that I really liked um, about sort of the way you described this transition was sort of the emerging use. It seemed like a lot of um, LGBT communities uh, uh, were making of this sort of semiotization of gender norms, as it were. In other words, people had previously taken them for granted. And part of, it seemed like part of what was so disconcerting was the way that previously um, sort of fixed gender norms were used to communicate information. Is, is, that, is that a fair way of describing sort of the historical development there yeah i i I think at least initially right that that the the response was just i you know well i don't want to so i think it's a little bit more complicated now of course Mm -hmm. um right so so some of the first kind of responses we see to these gender bending is actually in cross-dressing ordinances um which predate some of the the more progressive, you know, the, the really organized progressive uh, entities, which you know go in and, and try to close down bars and reform, um, you know, reform urban life. Um, but yeah, I I think this idea, you know, the the idea that you know women are are dressing as men in order to earn a wage, and and men are you know dressing as like women and and. Uh, engaging in these effeminate kinds of of behaviors just for fun and for right this kind of self actualization, um, you know, really did you know really was quite a shock I think to the the folks that, that saw this because they weren't right they 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 weren't used to the idea that that you could have gender fluidity it was just you know something that seemed very baked into the system and so um, yeah I think I think it really challenged their their understanding of what gender was. Yeah, and it seemed like from your description that there was a like a community building element to this kind of dangerous use of gender expression in sort of non socially conforming ways. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I think that one of the things that I thought was so telling um, <clears throat> is, well, I, I'll use the Chicago examples, which were a little bit later than you know, the, these are like nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. But they're they're really it's amazing the the intricate um, or you know the the, the cultural um, development that happened in this time the the way people related to one another the right the terms that they had for one another um, how they socialized how they met I mean it's it's a really much more vibrant community than I think a lot of people um, would think right I, I think a lot of people and George Chauncey you know, 20 years ago, particularly in New York, made this, this point in his, in his really wonderful book, um, you know, that, that the community was conspicuous, right? It, it was vibrant. It was lively. Um, it was not, you know, th- these folks were, you know, it seems by all accounts, really uh, living their best lives. 
Um, and, and, it, and it wasn't the, you know, they, they weren't living in the shadows in the way that I think a lot of people presume in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s that they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what came across to me too, like in the way you kind of narrati- narrativize the entire history through the lens of the law is the way in which this community that existed and that people were aware of, but that wasn't necessarily recorded or like explicitly acknowledged in a way that kind of more conventional society would have been nonetheless continued to shape the law moving forward in ways that are visible but obscure right. today, yeah. it seems like. So one of the things that I think is so crucial here is that, right, so in if we look at the 1890s, early 1900s, we have these, um, they're, they're private entities, these, these social reformer progressives, um, right, that, for example, the Chicago Vice Commission or, right, the, the Committee of 15 in New York, um, right, that they're not, they're not agencies, they're not really governmental entities in the way that we would think of them, you know, think of regulation today. Um, and, but they're, but they're progressives and they're part of a very, you know, a much broader progressive movement, um, right, to, to target prostitution and child labor and immigration and, and, you know, these other, you know, these vast other issues that progressives wanted to target in this era. And what they needed to achieve their goals eventually was a administrative state, right? So you, so you have, um, right, this growth of an administrative state, and they're dealing with these issues of sexuality and uh, you know other progressive policies, and they need to figure out what they're doing, right? They're they're kind of uh, <laughs> they're they're learning on the fly uh, and regulating as they go. Um, and what happens as a as a consequence is they they start to try to regulate what they see as this kind of degenerate class of people uh, who they don't really have a name for yet. They start to call them third sexers. And these, right, these are kind of LGBTQ people as a whole. Um, and the main identifier that they use to classify these individuals isn't their same sex uh, you know, relationships or, or sexual conduct. It's their gender um, expressions. Uh, so, right. So any form of, of effeminacy in a man or masculinity in a woman kind of got, you know, got them put in this category of third sexers. Um, and that's how we started to get this idea of sexual orientation. Um, and it's very much tied to the rise of the administrative state flowing from this progressive era, uh, in which, you know, masculinity was, was the, it was they were trying to reform masculinity, protect the home, um, and and really just kind of double down on what they thought was uh, you know the American identity they wanted to preserve going forward. Yeah, well, maybe you could spend a little bit more time kind of elaborating on this concept of the third sex emerging in. I took it to be sort of like the like late nineteenth, early twentieth, well, primarily early twentieth century, and sort of as a prelude to thinking about how we still see reflections of that concept in the law of sexuality today. Yeah. So, um, so I think the liquor agencies, you know, in the 1930s and 1940s, the state liquor agencies are really great examples of, of, um, how the, how government was an active part in creating these labels of sexual orientation, third sex and, and the like. Um, and what had happened in after after prohibition's repeal um, is that state liquor agencies had promulgated rules about what kinds um, of of uh, behaviors and and things might qualify uh, to revoke liquor licenses, um, and they're very very broad, broadly written. Um, and one of the things that that these liquor agents do is when they see just any sign of gender nonconformity, you know, again, effeminacy in a man or masculinity in a woman, they think that that's an indication that that's a place that, uh, you know, suffers or entertains or harbors, um, you know, 
homosexuals generally. And they, so they use these, these cue or they use these, these signals of gender nonconformity as a cue for the presence of the class as a whole. Um, and so you get this idea, I think, that's ingrained in large part because of right the, the way that they construct these identities, that you have real men and you have real women, and then you have this, this other group of nonconformists. Um, and what gets obscured in that is the fact that there is a lot of gender diversity within the LGBTQ community, right? You have uh, very masculine gay men and you have very effeminate uh, lesbian women and, and all, you know, and everything in between. It's a very diverse community. But from the outsider perspective, that's not what they see. What they see is these gender bending nonconformists. Um, and they use them as, right, again, this kind of heuristic for what the entire community looks like. And so they're, the way that they engage in that kind of, um, you know, that kind of regulation of sexual minorities, I think is very telling for how we think about, um, right, why do people harbor the animus they do towards uh, LGBTQ people now? And, and, and in large part, I think you can trace it back to this idea of um, you know, LGBTQ people being seen as overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, uh, comprised of individuals who define gender norms. Yeah, no, I mean, that's it, it, it really, it seemed to me as if the anxiety over this or the anxiety kind of provoked or that was reflected in the emergence in this concept of the third sex as you describe it was sort of like an anxiety associated with the fracturing of this conflation of of sex and gender of kind of biology and and sociology that that was happening at the time is, yeah. is that do you think that makes is that yeah. a fair way of well i i think i so i think part of the reason why you have that phenomenon is because while you have the emergence and the rise of the administrative state doing these things you also have the medicalization of homosexuality happening and so you and and so they're they're trying to create these uh right medical categories to understand the the behaviors and and that you know and, and these kind of cultural pockets that they that they've encountered along the way uh, of these other right progressive uh, you know uh, ambitions that that uh, right where progressive reformers run into these LGBTQ people um, and so I think that that's that's kind of part of that story too um, but I for you know present day purposes one of the things i think that we can take away from that story is right even our own american cultural understandings of sex haven't always been 100% about biology um right it, it's a much more complicated story than than what you would um hear from from people arguing in courts about title 7 um or title 9 today uh mm. it, it's a much more complex story than, you know, sex has always meant biology or sex has always been male or female. You know, we, we've been grappling with what that, you know, what does sex mean and who are members of what sex and, um, you know, what are the legal implications for that for, for, you know, decades at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, and to, just to jump back a little bit um, to your discussion of the state liquor agencies. I mean, it struck me that one really interesting part of the story was sort of the role that bars and saloons played as social spaces during the period of time you're describing, which may not have been entirely the same role that they play today, especially in an urban context. And sort of, in a way, it almost kind of underscored the inevitability of an event like Stonewall happening in a bar rather than in some other kind of social space. Yeah. You know, I, so I think this is, so one thing that I would love to write about in the future is kind of this, uh, this idea of, right. The bars, the gay bars being, uh, you know, kind of a special legal space and a cultural space. Um, mm. because, you know, whether you, you look at what was happening in the 1890s, um, you know, so, so let me just, I'll just pull a little anecdote out. There's a, there's a story in, um, from, uh, it's one of the newspapers in Brooklyn. Uh, I think it's 1892. Um, and there's this bar in, in Manhattan and it's a real dive bar. 
and the reporter notes this exchange between two friends who walk in and the one friend says, um, you know, I only want to be here for, for 10 minutes, one drink. And the friend responds, you've been here for, you know, you've already been here for 15 minutes. It's time to go. And you can, and you can already, you know, you can sense this, right. This, this interaction, right. Where these friends are debating how long they want to stay at this bar and um, you know, how, how many people they want to, you know, flirt with or, you know, interact with at, at the bar before they, it's time for them to go home. You know, you can kind of see that, same story, that same dialogue happening, you know, in any uh, LGBTQ space today, right? Um, it's a it's a very familiar scene, <laughs> um, and I think what what's so telling about that is, you know, the the the, the gay bar, the lesbian bar, um, you know, these LGBTQ friendly spaces are incredibly important in terms of understanding the story of, of LGBTQ Americans and, and LGBTQ Americans cultural, um, you know, community identity. Um, and again, it was true in the 1890s. It's true in, in Stonewall, right? The reason why we have, I think this, you know, the Stonewall riots in the first place is because this idea of police oppression, um, you know, invading a very sacred space. And it's the, um, you know, and it's the same reason why I think people felt so, um, you know, so, you know, just I guess it would I just say it would hit home when the Pulse tragedy in Orlando happened, you know, a mm. few years ago. Um, right. These are very much sacred spaces for, for people. Um, and, and there's a long history, uh, you know, to that story. So so. I, to, to kind of bring it home, maybe you could talk a little bit about how this history should inform our understanding of the law of sexuality today, and maybe also a little bit about how this history could help us resolve some of the confusion in the way that the doctrine yeah. of the law of sexuality seems to kind of really fundamentally misunderstand what's at stake. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just jump into title seven because it's been on my mind for a few, for a few years. Um, and it might be on, on Monday if we get cert grants or denials, but um, you know, so, so there's an issue in title seven as to whether sexual orientation discrimination um, and transgender discrimination are, uh, you know, subsets of, of sex discrimination and therefore actionable under Title VII. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll focus on the sexual orientation ones because uh, cases because that's what the paper really focuses on. Um, but there, there's three theories that uh, that courts have looked at and two courts, the seventh and the second court, second circuit courts have adopted in some variety um, as to why sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. Um, the first one I think is real easy. Uh, if you just replace the sex of, of the employee, it's a clear but for causation, right? So if, if, if John, your employee can date Sue, but you know, uh, you know, but but if John uh, can't date David, right? That it's it's but for his sex that he's been fired for sexual orientation. If you fired him because of right who he's dating or who he's having intimate relationships with, um, you know. So I think that's kind of an analytically easier uh, right uh, way to understand the relationship between sex and sexual orientation discrimination. The the second one is this idea of associational discrimination, which I don't really think is all that terribly different from the but for example that I just gave. Uh, but the idea is, right, that that if you, you can't discriminate against a person in employment based on the associations they have with people provided those associations are rooted in a protected class. So you can't, uh, you know, if, if you wouldn't fire, uh, you know, Mary for marrying David, then you can't fire her for, for Mary, you know, marrying, uh, you know, Josie because, right, that's sex discrimination. It's just, you're just changing the sex and that's a protected association. But the, 
the one that I find to be the most interesting is this idea of gender nonconformity being an actionable form of sex discrimination. And it goes all the way back to Pricewaterhouse versus Hopkins, which in 1989, the Supreme Court said that if you take uh, you know, sex stereotypes and gender nonconformity into account, that's an unlawful form of sex discrimination. Um, and, and courts really pushed back against the idea for a long time that uh, that this could be used as an easy vehicle to catch all sexual orientation discrimination claims, but they allowed effeminate men and masculine women who were discriminated against because of their effeminacy or masculinity um, to, to bring Title VII claims. The issue is now, and I'll turn it to, to the Seventh Circuit decision in Hively, which is the first decision which held in an appellate court that Title VII sex discrimination provision protects uh, against sexual orientation discrimination, um, that this gender nonconformity theory could apply to all sexual orientation discrimination claims because if you are a gay, lesbian, or bisexual person, you are innately, you know, uh, you know, running up against the grain of what we as a society expect you to do. We expect men to date women and women to date men, and so if you don't do that exclusively, you are inherently nonconforming. Now, I I kind of felt find that to be somewhat icky in the first instance because I don't like the idea of saying because you're not conforming gay, lesbian, bisexual people, you're you know you're, you've got this legal action uh, available to you if you're discriminated against. It, you know that just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Um, mm. And the doctrinally important thing about about the decision is it removes. Um, it removes the the idea of nonconformity slightly away from our ideas of of it being grounded in discrimination because of our expectations of masculinity and femininity, right? Like that's really the heart of gender nonconformity doctrine. And so I think the history is really is really telling here, right? That what the history shows is from the very first instance of people trying to regulate LGBTQ people and LGBTQ spaces, it has been about reforming, trying to reform masculinity and protect the home and traditional gender norms, right? That, that it's, that the way that the law has evolved over time because of the way you know, the government and the social reformers saw the LGBTQ community as consisting, at, you know, over, again, overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, of gender bending nonconformity uh, or nonconformists, that the animus driven towards them was, or is, that's driven towards the LGBTQ community is rooted in these ideas, deeply rooted in these ideas of masculinity and femininity and reforming them. Um, right to preserve some kind of patriarchal norm um, where masculinity supremacy is not challenged, and so I think that you know the the courts going forward when they hear these these cases, whether, whether it's the Supreme Court in the next few months, or whether it continue, these cases continue to percolate in in district and, and uh, appellate courts in the federal system and in the state courts as well, right? That that the courts really understand that this that the animus. And the, the way that our understanding of sexuality in the workplace and sexuality in the family um, and LGBTQ people and how these things all interact is so rooted in masculinity and femininity and the norms surrounding them that that really, um, in my mind, cements this notion that gender nonconformity doctrine should, should do a lot of work here. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the Seventh Circuit's decision was ultimately correct, but I think the, the rationale uh, could could use some some history, right? The rationale and 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 the the uh, the reasoning that the courts use in getting us to that place um, can be dramatically improved with a really good, robust understanding of the history. So, Anthony, in in closing, um, and I don't know, this might be a, a tough one to answer because I don't have any first clue how to answer it. But I mean, do you think that the doctrine of the law of sexuality can accommodate this kind of change of perspective or does it require a more fundamental shift, like a sort of an entirely new way of conceptualizing the nature of the problem? Well, I think there's, <laughs> so there's the legal realist in me and then there's the, the idealist. Um, in, in my kind of ideal academic world, I think these things can really all be, uh, you know, they can all be 
squared away with one another in a very comprehensive way that makes sense, right? The doctrine can accommodate, um, right, tweaking our understanding of these issues, and and uh, yeah, you know, I think it can do that. There's no problem there. The legal realist in me says that that will never happen. Because in order for that to happen, you need judges who really can understand these issues, who can grasp the history, who can understand the cultural issues at stake, who really have the, right, the cultural competency to you know, kind of piece together the, the, our under, traditional understandings of sex discrimination and LGBTQ identity and the history and the doctrine um, and make sense of it. And I don't think that we have a lot of judges who can do that. Um, and we definitely don't have a Supreme Court majority, I don't think, that can do that. Um, and so, so I think, you know, there's plenty of room in the doctrine to, right, to make the mess clean. <laughs> um, but I don't know if we have the, the you know, kind of the, the firepower on the, on the courts right now to be able to do that. I would love to be pleasantly surprised. So, you know, if the Supreme Court does take up these cases, um, you know, who knows? But but I think that also illustrates the importance of the Supreme Court um, either taking up all these cases, right, the the transgender discrimination case and the sexual orientation discrimination sexual orientation discrimination discrimination cases, either taking them all up at once or taking none of them for now, right? Because they these things can't be decided or seen in piecemeal anymore. I think it's time that we understand. And, uh, you know, we often talk about the LGBTQ community as being a kind of a cohesive community. And there's certainly a lot of diversity and a lot of issues that impact different members of the LGBT community differently. Um, but, but there's a lot of doctrinal, um, commonalities that we can, right. We can see, um, between transgender discrimination, sex discrimination, and sexual orientation discrimination. And so, my hope is no matter what happens that the judges really do look at these things as a comprehensive problem um, and, and address them with a really good understanding of the history, a really good understanding of where the doctrine has done a lot of good and where it's fallen short, um, and then takes right takes a doctrine and just reorganizes it. I think uh, in a way that that makes sense uh, of all these you know all these issues and right and does the most work for the most people. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see your paper when when the final version is ready. I'm looking forward to it myself. <laughs> a new kind of cool. A new kind of cool. A new kind of cool from British Sterling. Bitter lemon, aftershave and cologne. A new kind of cool. Bitter lemon, a new kind of cool. A fresh, enduring cool that goes beyond lime. A new kind of cool called bitter lemon. Cool, fresh and lasting. It go away beyond lime. Cool, fresh and lasting. It called bitter lemon. Bitter lemon, aftershave and cologne. A new kind of cool, let me tell you, man. It called bitter lemon. New from British Sterling. Mm-hmm.